So 1 Samuel 16, this is where it gets a little touchy because God says to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul seeing that I have rejected him? There's no slide for this, so don't worry. I didn't put a slide. just wanted to summarize it. How long are you going to mourn, Samuel, for Saul? I've rejected him from reigning over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and go, for I have provided myself a king among Jesse's sons. What a great thing that we know God is in charge. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. He is in charge. He's seated on the throne. Our lives look very chaotic. The political scene looks very chaotic, doesn't it? You try to watch these stories on the news, and it's like, oh, what the heck is going on? I watch one channel, and then I look at the other channel, and it's a totally opposite story. It's like marriage counseling. <laughs> it really is. Because if I talk to the wife by herself, and then I talk to the husband by herself, I'm like, you two people can't be married. That's two totally different stories. Now, and I'm sure that would be true if me and Trish, you know, had that too. I'm not criticizing anybody. It's just so human nature that we see things through a certain lens. And everybody else that doesn't see it that way is wrong, and we're right. And if they could just be more like me, the world would be a better place. No. Right? We all have something we can learn. So... Samuel's there, and he sees these sons coming by him, and they're very big and strong. They're soldiers, and oh, Samuel's, that's Samuel. Very, very mature guy, pro prophet, saying, this must be the one, because he looks the part. <laughs> and God says to him, wait a minute, don't look at his appearance or his physical stature. I've refused him. The Lord does not see as a man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the... Not at the resume, not at the bank account, not at all the car that you drive. That isn't it. I look at your heart. So that better be where we start with the heart. Saul and David is battling over your heart. We think it's our mind, but, but the Bible says guard your heart, for out of it flow the issues of life. This up here, the mind is driven by what's in here of our motives, right? So you change this and this changes. And then that's this is the part that I was saying gets touchy because Samuel says to Jesse, wait a minute, I, I saw all these sons come by and he didn't give me the green light on any of them. Another sign of how well Samuel knew the voice of the Lord. Not to, no, there's gotta be another one. And, and, and Jesse's like, oh yeah, there is one more. Did that ever strike anybody funny? What do you mean there's one more? Like, he asked for all your sons. This one's out tending the sheep? Maybe he's a half-breed. Maybe he's not really considered a full son because he should have been called because he's a son. But if he's a half-son, right, if he's a stepchild, now, we don't know this for sure. It's just a little bit of speculation. Not really, but, you know, scholars believe it could be true. And, and here's one of the reasons, right? His, mother na his mother's name is not mentioned in the Bible. Right? So that seems a little odd for such a guy that has so much written about him, so many chapters written about him. We don't know his mother's name. There's tradition, but she's not named. And then he says in, in Psalm 69, 8, I'm a foreigner to my own family, a stranger to my own mother's children. If it's true that he was only a stepchild, what would that have meant potentially in his family relationship with his half-brothers. Yeah, he, he might have been put down. Maybe he had the job of watching the sheep because he was like the Cinderella person, you know, like, you're going to mop the floors. We're all going to the ball. And who does God choose to be the king? The one mopping the floor. The one watching the sheep. Because he had a little harp out there with him, which I would call a guitar, just for modern language. Because God loves guitars. And he was writing these amazing songs to God. And only people that could, only things that could hear him were the sheep. So God looked at his heart like, oh, look at this guy. He loves me. He's singing to me directly because the sheep don't know what he's saying. Ha, huh, that's the guy qualified. Never went to school to be president. But his heart qualified him. What about us? And what dictates the heart, whether we're walking by the spirit or the flesh? Because we keep going off the rails if we're walking by our flesh. So this is an important thing, isn't it? 
All right, so it wasn't just that. He then says in Psalm 51, 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Right? Now, you don't have to take that as evidence. It's not a trial, but it's possible that David was a stepchild. What would that mean to his identity? He would feel like an orphan to some degree. He would feel like he didn't have the right relationship with his father that the other people had. That's what the word that Cheryl just got this morning. I didn't feel like I had the right relationship with my father in heaven. We all could have this issue. David had all these other great things going for him, but he didn't see God through the right lens. It was tainted. So a good prayer request is, Lord, shift my thinking. Shift my heart so that when I think about you, I don't think of you as a punishing earthly father, but I see you as a loving heavenly father. And when you tell me to do the things you tell me to do and what not to do in here, it's for my good because you love me. You're not a joy killer. Not a bunch of rules and restrictions. It's rules for life on how to prosper. Be ready to commit your life in covenant before you have sex with somebody. That's a good one. I'll have to say Selah on that one. <laughs> Romans 8. If you live in accordance with the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. All who are led by the Spirit of God, you see, are... Man, think of all the times you read this in the Bible. We're his children. He's our father, Abba. He's our daddy. And yet, if we're tilted in our lens the way we look at him, Saul can win. Or David, even though David had this relationship, when it came to his relationship with women, he wasn't seeing it through the right lens. He didn't understand that covenant relationship. So it gives credence to that idea that he could have been that stepchild that felt rejected. Because, you know, whatever you judge, you end up becoming. I wish we could change that rule. But what you have to do is repent of judging. Not change the, the rules of engagement were set when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. That's just the way it worked. That brought death in. And part of death is judging. And when you judge somebody, you're bound to become. It's the law of sowing and reaping. You're bound to become that. Now, again, it's just speculating with David whether that was the case. But he clearly had a problem with his sexual appetite. It brought the whole nation down when he sinned with Bathsheba, right? Like that was the beginning of the end of the whole nation. Because when the leader is righteous, the people uh, rejoice. But when there's sin, it ripples down, doesn't it? Kind of a sobering word, isn't it? 14 of Romans 8 says, all who are led by the spirit of God, you see, are God's children. You didn't receive a spirit of slavery, did you? A little louder, please. No. <laughs> To go back again into a state of fear. No, you received the spirit of sonship in whom we call out Abba, Father. How am I doing on time? I'm going to wrap it up soon. So here's something that hit me while I was studying. It's like we have this choice between our flesh and our spirit. Our spirit is the father of lights. That's what the Bible says right here in James 1.17. Every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the, come on. Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. And then this flesh side is the father of lies. And lights and lies sounds pretty close, doesn't it? Especially when Satan comes as light. Ha! So there's clearly a contrast here between light and darkness. And Jesus said, I'm going to take you out of darkness and bring you in into light, the light of the kingdom. So that's what it says in 844 of John, you're children of your father, the devil. And you love to do evil things that he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He's always hated the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, it's consistent with his character, for he's a liar and the father of lies. Why do we ever want to associate with that? Because it's clearly the wrong camp. It's clearly the Saul fleshly side and not that spirit side of saying spirit of truth. Holy Spirit, that's one of his names. Come and fill me. You guys doing all right? No condemnation. It's a choice. And it's the reality check of the rules of engagement that we all have to deal with every day. We don't get to rewrite the rules of engagement. We just get to interact with them in a godly way or in a fleshly way. And I'm going to choose to take Saul's armor off and follow God and not wear some counterfeit identity. I'm going to know what God's identity is for me because that's when I'll kill giants. 
not wearing somebody else's armor. There's a bunch of giants that need to die in my life. I don't know about you. So I can't afford to mess around with the little battery-operated toy. I need the bazooka, baby. We're killing giants. Galatians 5, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Sound like a familiar theme? For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. It says in this version. <laughs> People say, oh, I don't have a problem in that area. You're not the best self-assessment uh, person that there is. And usually when you say, I don't have a problem in that area, you let your guard down and boom, you just open up the door. I think he listens for that one. Oh, good. We have an overconfident person who doesn't realize that they could fall. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Ephesians 4. This is an action word, isn't it? Throw off your old sinful nature, and your former way of life. Who's he talking to? Not unbelievers. He's talking to Christians. So even though you're a Christian, there could still be an old way of life that's still living in you. And that's that flesh side. That's not, hasn't been crucified yet. That's not living by the Spirit. Throw it off. So if he's telling us to do it, it means we can do it. Yeah, that's right. And I would say it means we have to do it. Throw that off and your old former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and your attitudes, and then not just throw off, but what else? You see it up there? So you throw it off and you put it on. You throw it off and you put it on. What are we putting on? Our new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. And if you're teachable, man, God loves a teachable spirit, doesn't he? And as long as you're willing to say, huh, maybe this thought goes through. If I throw it off, then what am I going to be? Because the thing I'm throwing off, I really know how to work in that well. It's dysfunctional, but it was working <laughs> in a crazy kind of way. <laughs> you know, the car's still running, even only three cylinders are firing. No, no, junk that thing. God wants to give you a better way. He's got a new nature for you. Created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Remember this one? What do you want? I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. Jack Nicholson said. So this is where like the rubber meets the road because we could say, God, show me where I need to take off Saul's armor. And he's like, okay, be careful what you ask for because you might get it because when I show you, you better be ready to handle it. Did it go up there? Yeah. That's a heck of a scene, isn't it? God's not saying you can't handle the truth, okay? I'm not making that analogy. I'm just saying when you hear the truth, it's hard to hear sometimes, right? So if, he, if Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth, then we have to give him permission. I'm really asking you, show me. Search my heart. Reveal if there's anything in me that needs to be exposed, and I'll do something about it when you show me and not run and hide from it. 